Matthew 5, and I'm going to be at verse 38 down to verse 43. Matthew 5, 38, 43. If you don't have your Bibles, it is on the screen behind me. Verse 38, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So we're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount, looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to pursue Jesus with our lives? And so there's no better place to look at it than to look at the words and the teachings of Jesus of, here's what I expect from you as a follower of Jesus. By now, you've probably lived long enough to experience the law of nature that states that what we give is returned to us. This law of sowing or reaping. The little boy that went um, with his parents to a cabin in the mountains. And as he was there, he loved going to the cliff. And he'd put, cup his hands together. And he would yell um, into the mountains. And he would hear the echo back. And he'd say, hello. And the mountains would scream back, hello, hello, hello. He'd say, I love you. And the mountains would scream back, I love you, I love you, I love you. The little boy didn't understand that it was his own voice that was speaking to him. He thought the mountains were talking to him. And one day, he gets into an angry fight with his uh, parents, and he's really mad and upset, and he storms out of the a cabin, and he yells, I hate you. And all of a sudden, the mountains yells, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, to his shock. The law of echoes. It's a law that's basically inescapable for all of us. Children end up echoing their parents, and students end up echoing their teachers, and Husbands and wives respond in kind to their spouses. A church becomes a reflection of its pastor. There was a case study that was done a few years ago where um, they took a group of students in high school, gave them a piece of paper and said, you have 30 minutes, or I'm sorry, 30 seconds. And in these 30 seconds, here's what I want you to do. I want you to list the name of everyone that you hate. You've got 30 seconds to write these names down. Some of these guys would sit there for 30 seconds and they'd maybe have one name or two names. But there's one guy that actually had 14 names of people that he absolutely disliked and hated. 14 names in 30 seconds, that's a pretty bad guy. Um, And the analysis of the study at the end came to be that the study showed that those who disliked the most number of people was often on the list of the other people as well. They were the ones that were most disliked in their group as well. See, your attitudes always boomerang back on yourself. The Bible calls that sowing and reaping. It's not necessarily just in the negative, is it? When you bless others, God says you will be blessed. When you do an act of kindness to someone, that act of kindness is often reciprocated. They do an act of kindness to someone else. If you sow a good seed, the Bible says that you will reap a good harvest. But if you sow a bad seed, you'll either reap a bad harvest or you'll reap no harvest at all. A kind deed translates into an act of kindness, but a harsh word can destroy a person's mood, can destroy a person's day, and sometimes the word can be so bad, it can destroy a person's hope and future. Curses give birth to more curses. Anger leads to anger being reciprocated. Those of us who are married, we know what this is like, right? Um, Not that me and my wife ever fight, but let's just use an example of just being late, right? Um, I like to be on time on places, and she likes to be conveniently on time according to her schedule. We call it Indian Standard Time. It's whenever we show up, things happen. Um, and so if we ever fight, that's our biggest argument. Here's how it normally happens. I'll go in. I'll say, you're always late. And she doesn't respond back in a kind word and say, well, thank you for letting me know that, right? Right? What she does is when I attack her, then what does she do? She attacks right back. She goes, well, if you had helped with the kids, and if you had put the dishes away, or if you did this, and then she starts attacking me back. I attack her, she attacks back. And pretty soon, communication completely stops. I'm not talking to her, she's not talking to me. There is no dialogue at all. We get in the car, and there's just a sense of hostility and tension until one of us mans up and says, sorry. That's the way it is. Angry words, you get angry words back. And that's what Jesus addresses in our text this morning. This entire series, we've been seeing 
Jesus say stuff that are just so hard for us to swallow. These are things that makes absolutely no sense to us as, as individuals. Let's be honest. The things that Jesus says in this text, they're not easy things at all. It's much easier to live by the letter of the law than the intent of the law. It's much easier to say, well, I've never murdered anyone, so I'm good. I'm okay. I don't have any problems there. It's much more difficult when Jesus says, hey, it's not just about murder. There's an anger issue here that we want to address. That if you get angry at someone, it's just like murder. It's much easier to say, well, I've never committed adultery. I've never slept with a, someone who wasn't my spouse. Jesus says, well, that might be true and all. But what about your heart issue of your lust? What about the fact that you mentally are constantly lusting after someone or undressing someone in your mind or whatever that is, that you are behaving inappropriately even though the world cannot see it? God sees it. What about your heart? It's much easier to say, I never divorced my spouse. I'll stick with her till the end. But Jesus says, well, that's good and all. But the argument, the law wasn't just about not divorcing your spouse. The law was about you loving and pursuing and taking care of your spouse. It was for you guys to love your wife like Christ loved the church that you'd be willing to give your life for her. And for you wives, it's for you to submit and to her like we would do to the Lord, that we trust that he is good and faithful, that he would take care of us. See, those are hard things for us to swallow. And last week, Jay talked about that it's, it's easy to make promises. It's easy to say, I swear, or this is what, who I am, but, but it's much harder to be people of integrity, that we don't have to make promises, that we don't have to say, I swear to God, that we don't have to say, we don't have to preface our statements because we're so trustworthy that people know that if we say something, it's going to happen because that's the kind of people that we are. So we don't have to say, I promise I'm going to do this. We, all we have to say is, I'm going to do this, and they know we're going to do it because that's the kind of people we are. See, this is hard things for us to swallow. These are hard things for us to understand, but these are God's expectations of us. This is how we model Jesus in the world that we live in. And this morning, our text is going to challenge us on how we respond to what people do and what people say about us. Nietzsche once wrote that revenge is the greatest instinct in the human race. See, human nature tells us that people should get what they deserve. We're born ready to retaliate. Those of you who have kids, you know this. Watch your children. I don't have to teach my one-year-old to punch his brother or sister. He does it very naturally. It's very easy. I don't have to teach him to pull her hair. He just loves to do that. I don't have to teach him to push them or anything like that. I don't have to teach him how to do, be bad. I've got to teach him how to be good. It's a natural instinct right from the beginning to fight and to defend yourself. You push your brother, you punch him in the stomach. Little childish fights often prelude to adult retaliation. The Romans called it quid pro quo, something for something. The English called it tit for tat. In the Old Testament, Moses called it an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Retaliation is an endless echo that is part of our human nature. Mahatma Gandhi, who was deeply influenced by the Sermon on the Mount, even though he never became a follower of Jesus, the principles of the Sermon on the Mount influenced how he led the revolt in India against the British. In reading on this portion, he said, an eye for an eye would make the entire world blind. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will get us all into big trouble. See, but Jesus is calling us to a completely different lifestyle. He's calling us to be models and reflections of him. He's calling us to model the grace and the love that he has given us when we don't deserve it. And in our text this morning, we'll see that he actually calls us to five different things in how we live. The first thing is that he calls us to be reasonable. Verse 38 says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is actually a quote from the Old Testament. Moses says this about 1,400 years before the time of Jesus. It's found in Exodus 21, and here's what the entire verse says. Life for life, 
to eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. That's what the verse says. In Leviticus 24, Moses continues, he says, If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Now you hear that, that sounds brutal. That sounds barbaric. Can you imagine playing a game of pick up basketball and you accidentally elbow a guy in the eye? The law would say that they have every right to elbow you back. That sounds mean. The reality is that when Moses was enforcing this law, he was enforcing it, and it was a huge step forward in justice. It was like the American Wild West back then, a bunch of gunslingers, a bunch of warlords, warlords, a bunch of kings. If a man knocked out someone's tooth, the victim could kill him in a fit of rage, and then he could go and wipe out his entire city, his whole family, his village, his tribe. He could just go postal on them. In Genesis 4, you see this... Um, genealogy of, from the um, time of Adam, and he gets to Cain's son. And Cain's son, in verse Genesis 4, 23, he's bragging. And here's what he says. He says, I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for simply striking me. This was the day, this was the age that, that they lived in. This was the type of people that they were. There's a story in Genesis of Jacob's daughter, Dina, being raped. And her brothers find out that the man raped him. You know what they did? The brothers got together. They went into the tribe where the, found the man that raped him. They murdered him, and they murdered every man and every boy in that village. This was the cruelty of the world before there was eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. So when Moses begins to write the first five books of the Old Testament, God was using him to replace personal vendettas with a rule of law. Vigilante justice was no longer permitted in the land. No longer was it okay to go postal because you were offended or you didn't like someone. Moses was now communicating to the people that the punishment has to fit the crime. It is the foundation for all of justice. Without it, the strong would bully the weak, and the vindictive will exact more than what's necessary for justice. And by the time we get to Jesus' day, it just gets worse. The law had been completely dismantled by the religious leaders that now you could actually go into a bedroom of a woman having an affair, pull her out of her bed, drag her into the streets, and stone her. You could take Jesus, for example. He's teaching in a synagogue, and he's teaching them, and the people don't like what they hear. So when they create an insurrection, they actually try to throw him off of a cliff. One of Jesus' own disciples when Jesus was about to be arrested, he pulls out a sword and swipes the ear off of a servant. This was the time that they were living in. A man could simply get his throat slit for making a politically incorrect statement. Can I suggest to you that times have not changed at all? In fact, it's gotten worse, hasn't it? As a society, we have a lost a sense of civility and perspective. And today we live in an era of Facebook and YouTube and blogs and Twitter and for the opportunities for our frustration and anger. It's the opportunity for it to go viral is there. Sometimes it's amusing to go on Facebook and see what petty issues people get angry about. Other times it's actually disheartening the words that we will type out for the world to see in our moment of rage and our anger. And the things that make us mad often are petty issues. Have a person cut in front of you while you're driving, and that's all it takes for you to momentarily lose your salvation. I mean, you've got to get rebaptized and everything just because someone cut in front of you in front of the road. Someone gives you an opinion of something, and you don't like their opinion, and all of a sudden you find ways to put that person down and find faults in that person. People might hurt you for a moment, but you will let them experience the pain of your hurt for a lifetime. You will let them pay you back forever. See, there's so many ways for us to go beyond an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So Moses is encouraging us in the Old Testament, hey, be reasonable. Keep things in perspective. Let the punishment fit the crime. Let the response fit the offense. Calm down. 
Think things through. Pray things through. Be reasonable. Let's be honest. That right there is more than enough for us today. Because a lot of us, we respond in our anger and hate. And we'll say things. And we'll write things. And late, minutes or hours later, we regret what we said and we regret what we wrote. But it's too late to take it back. And we have deeply hurt someone. We wounded someone. So Moses encourages us, be reasonable. Pull back for a second. Think about what you're going to say. Because your words have the power to bring life or death. You can either edify someone or you can destroy someone. So watch what you say when you're angry. Watch what you say when you get offended. Watch what you say when you get hurt. The second thing Moses, um, Jesus says in our text is be irresistible. Verse 39 says, do not resist the one who is evil. Right, now that's a crazy command. Aren't you supposed to take care of yourself? Aren't you supposed to defend yourself? Aren't you supposed to defend your family, keep them from evil and danger and harm? Are you simply supposed to stand around meekly while evil triumphs? Absolutely not at all. Do you realize who's saying these words? It's Jesus. You remember what he did um, a few chapters later? He gets pretty angry, and he takes a whip, and he goes into a temple, and he just goes crazy. He starts throwing tables over, drives people out of the temple. This is the same Jesus that says, do not resist the one who is evil. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter, the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone whom he may devour, so resist him. The book of James, James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So what's Jesus saying? Why is he saying, do not resist the one who is evil? The word resist there is, means to go after someone. It has a sense of, don't go chase after them. This is not about standing your ground. It's about actually going and pursuing someone who's hurt you. This is about taking matters into your own hands. God has ordained people that will deal with the offense, and God has ordained people that will deal with the evil. He calls us to live under the rule of the law, not to play the judge, jury, and executioner all by ourselves. So let the governing authorities govern, whether that's civil authorities or whether that's the home or whether that's a church or whether that's the school. Let the people in charge do what they need to do. Listen, this all ties back to the Beatitudes. Only when you are poor in spirit, only when you are meek, will you know that you are not a law unto yourself or that you're not Superman that's here to save the day. But we got to take this deeper because there's a spiritual issue at work here. When we try to take the law into our own hands, do you know what that communicates? That communicates that we don't trust God to take care of our business. That we have to fight our own battles. So the question we have to ask is, do we believe that God will take care of us? Do we, can we relax and let the chips of his providence fall where he has ordained them to fall. See, the problem is that we think we have to play the role of the Holy Spirit, that we have been ordained by God to fix everyone else and to point to everyone else's problems out for them. But that's not your role. That is not your responsibility. We may not follow others around with a gun trying to make them change, but we will stalk people to try to fix their problems and try to make the world safe for democracy, our kids, and even for us to enjoy an apple pie. We're weird like that. And in our zeal to go after evil, we sometimes get in God's way. And a non-believer who watches us will wonder if we really believe that God is sufficient to take care of us. I have a friend who, he's a little too extreme politically for me, but he loves Jesus. And recently he was um, telling me a story, a couple years ago, he was telling me a story about how he was having coffee with an agnostic friend of his. This is right before the 2012 election. And my friend was going on and on about how if there wasn't going to be change in Washington, that it was all doomsday and the world was going to collapse and we might as well move to Canada. I don't know why we'd want to move there, but um, that's, what he, he, that's what he was communicating. And as he was going on and on and on, his agnostic friend said, I can understand why a lot of people are anxious and worried about this election, but I would think that you Christians would be much calmer. 
I guess if I had your faith, I would know that the sun would come up the day after the election and God would still be in charge of the universe no matter who we put in the White House. Ouch. What a great rebuke for us as followers of Jesus from someone who claims he doesn't even believe in God. That we can trust God no matter what happens, that when the sun goes up tomorrow morning, he's still in control. When the sun sets and we put our eyes to sleep and we have no control over who can come near our house or touch us or anything, and we are absolutely in deep sleep, he's watching over us. That we could trust God with our lives. See, our faith is irresistible to other people. Our faith is attractive to other people. Our faith draws other people, especially non-believers. When we rest in God, when we trust God, when we say, God, I don't have the world under control. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I can trust you. I can know that tomorrow, if you give me another day, you've given it to me. I can trust that if I wake up tomorrow, you have a plan and purpose for my life. I can trust that in the midst of my hardships and difficulties, you will turn it out for good because that is what you have promised. I can trust you with my life. It might not make any sense to me. I might not understand why I go through what I go through. I might not make sense why I experience the pain and the hardships that I experience, but I can trust that because I belong to you, not a hair of my head is going to fall off unless you allow it. And so I can trust you with my life. See, this is what makes our faith attractive. It's not us coming to church and singing a few songs and hanging out together. What makes our faith attractive is how we respond when things don't turn out well. How we respond when people attack you and say mean things to you. How we respond when life just crumbles around you and you still choose whether to trust God or take matters into your own hands. See, that's what's going to make our faith irresistible to people. So trust God with your life. Trust God with the circumstances of your life. Trust God that when people turn against you, that you have a God who will take care of you. You don't need to defend yourself. You don't need to prove yourself. He will watch out for you. The third thing, be unflappable. Verse 39. This verse says that if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. Those are difficult words to swallow. They go against everything we have learned growing up. They go against everything in the movies that we have watched from Hollywood. We're a nation who's been taught to defend ourselves. We're part of a state whose unofficial motto is, don't mess with Texas. That's who we are. You don't mess with us, right? Do you, but there's some things that you need to understand about the culture of Jesus' day. The word for slap there literally means to slap with an open arm like that. But Jesus also talks about slapping the right cheek. Most people are right-handed. Jesus is speaking of a backhanded slap across the face. And according to rabbinic law, if someone hits you with the back of his hand, it's twice as insulting as if someone just slapped you right across your face. The backhanded slap was a calculated contempt saying, contempt basically saying you're a nobody. You're worthless. You have no value. Slaves in those times said it was better to be beaten by a whip than to be slapped across the face, back, back slapped across the face. This is worse than a punch in your mouth. This was a slap at your very self-worth. It was saying you have no value or worth. And according to Jewish law, if you were back slapped, you could actually sue the person for defamation of character. And Jesus shows up and says, don't retaliate. In fact... Don't just retaliate, turn your other cheek. Listen, I'm the type that when someone offends me, I am quick to defend myself. I am quick to want to make my name right. So when Jesus says, hey, when someone says something bad to you or when someone slaps you, when someone attacks you, turn the other cheek, that's not an easy thing for me to do. And yet that's exactly what he's calling us to do here. He's saying, swallow your pride. Give up your rights to restitution and fairness. You're to set aside your inclination to get even, even when you're offended. Retaliation focuses on how we have been hurt. If our spouse says something hurtful, 
It's like a slap in the face. And instead of bearing it silently, we slap back, verbally or physically. If our friends are late, we get even by pouting at them the entire time when they show up. If people smear our reputation, we spread even more juicier gossip about them. Turning the other cheek focuses on the well-being of others rather than your own hurt. It proves that we really are poor in spirit, that we really are meek, that we really do hunger and thirst for righteousness instead of revenge. It shows that we are merciful. It shows that we are poor in spirit. It shows that we are peacemakers. It shows that we are being willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, you can't live the beatitude life that Jesus is calling us to live unless we are willing to turn the other cheek. All of those things that sound good in the first section of Matthew 5, you can't do that unless you're willing to say, it's not about me. It's that I'm willing to turn the other cheek when someone says something about me. It's not easy to do that when others put you down. You remember when Jesus was arrested, the Bible says that he was repeatedly slapped over and over in the face by the religious leaders when he was going on trial. What he experienced through that trial was a gross violation of the Mosaic law, but he bore it in silence. He never attacks back. He never says a word back. In fact, knowing Jesus, he probably did turn the other cheek. He probably said, I'll take it for that. So how often do we turn the other cheek? Do we let people run us over? Do we, there's one guy who said, the guy who's a new believer doesn't know anything about faith, and he said, the guy slapped me on one side, so I turned the other cheek, and he slapped me on the other side, and the pastor asked him, hey, what'd you do after that? He said, I decked him right after that. Because Jesus didn't say what else to do after that. He goes, um, so I just decked him. But Jesus did say what to do. Peter asked him, how many times are you supposed to forgive someone? And Jesus said, you're supposed to forgive someone 70 times 7. Basically, you never stop turning the other cheek. You never stop forgiving. Because Jesus never stops forgiving you. Because he gives you grace and mercy even when you don't deserve it. It's not just one time. And it's not just two times. And it's not just 70 times seven times. He's given you more than you've ever deserved. Instead of rising to the bait, we should be people that are unflappable. Number four. Be unsinkable. So now Jesus gives us two examples in our text. Two examples that are familiar with the people of their day, but unfamiliar with us. Verse 40, he says, If anyone sues you and takes your tunic, give him your coat as well. See, in Jesus' times, most people probably owned one or two pairs of shirts, and that was probably about it. In fact, the Bible says Jesus never owned anything. He had Undergarments, a robe, and sandals. That was his entire earthly possessions. The only way that you can get restitution in court was to literally sue someone for the shirt off of his back. Most people probably owned two or three shirts. They could afford to give up a shirt or two. But they only owned one outer garment or a cloak. That was your coat. If someone sued you for your coat, that was pretty serious. To lose your coat was to lose your dignity because you had no covering. Your coat was your blanket. If you lost your coat, you froze in the middle of the night. Your coat literally stood between you and death. The rabbinic law said that if you were sued for your coat and you lost it, you actually have a right to get it back in the evening so that you could stay warm. But then you'd have to give it back in the morning. And here comes Jesus and says, Give him your coat as well. Just give him your coat. What's he saying? Here's what he's saying, and I think it's important for us. He's saying, don't cling on to your things. Don't you know that if people take away your coat, God will take care of you. If someone takes away your house, God will put a roof over your shoulder, over your head. If someone takes away your money, God will feed you. If someone takes away your dignity, God will clothe you with his glory. See, the things that we fight for, the fight to hold on to our stuff, isn't isn't it because we put so much faith in our stuff 
that I can't live without this and I can't live without that and I can't survive unless I have this. We're quick to say, don't touch my stuff, don't take my things, don't mess with my belongings. As if our stuff gives us value and worth and dignity and significance. It breaks the heart of God when we trust our stuff more than we trust him. So Jesus says, if they take your stuff, don't worry about it. I will take care of you. The second thing he says, in verse 41, he says, if anyone forces you to go a mile, go with him two miles. Giving your coat away has to do with the things that you possess. Going the extra mile has to do with your time and your energy. Listen, we have so much fuel in our tank and time in our clock. That's all we have. We only have very limited. We work, we have kids, we have school, whatever. At the end of the day, we don't have a lot much more a lot more time to give away. Roman law said that you were required to lend an official a hand if they asked for it. By law, a soldier could demand from you that you carry his stuff on your back for about a mile and carry his possessions. It not only required the Jew to give up his time and go out of his way, but to expend his energy to help the enemy of his country. It was a slap in the face of a patriot or someone who loved his country to be able to, to have to carry the stuff of the person that was holding him hostage. And yet Jesus is saying, don't grumble. Actually, volunteer to go the extra mile and do it with a smile on your face. Go beyond what is required from the law. Don't you trust God enough to give you the energy that you need to get the rest of your work done? Don't you believe that God is in control of your time as well? See, ultimately, giving your coat and giving your going the extra mile is a statement of profound theological importance. Here's what it says. When we give our coats away and we give our time away, here's what it says. It says, I trust that God will take care of me. I trust that I belong to God. I trust that God is in control. Most of our angry words, most of our defensive pushbacks, most of our retaliations or wrongs that are done to us are a confession that we don't trust God with our lives. We don't trust God to be who he says he will be and do what he says he will do. And ironically, when we refuse to turn the other cheek, we're actually slapping God in the face. When we cling on to our stuff, we're desperately trying to put stuff in the place of God on the throne. The way we respond to those who wrong us is our most visible confession of our faith. We can only be reasonable and irresistible and unflappable and unsinkable if our faith is. Number five, be generous. Everything that Jesus said up to now culminates in verse 42. Give to those who beg from us. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This has nothing to do with lending or borrowing per se, even though that will apply. Jesus is speaking to the fact that all of us in this room, we're debtors. How many times have you done something for someone or offered a service for someone and then you made the comment, you owe me big time for this, right? I just went out of my way for you. Listen, there's a lot of things that people owe us. People owe us an apology. People owe us restitution. People might owe us money. They owe us a debt of gratitude. But can I suggest that you two owe too many people big time for all the things that you have done to hurt them? There are things that you have said and things that you have done that can never be paid back. A simple I'm sorry will never cut it. How many times has someone come to you and said, hey, I'm sorry for the things I said to you, things I'm said about you, or I'm sorry for hurting you, but you simply shrug your shoulders and you brush them off with a quick, oh, don't worry about it, just forget it. The truth is you just brush them off because you don't want to forget it. You don't want to forgive them, at least not right away. So you turn away from the one who wants to borrow on your good nature. See, sometimes our forgiveness bank shuts down. A spouse, a child, or a friend has come way too many times to draw on that account. And now that person is coming for the 500th time. 
Only this time you're not willing to open your heart anymore. How many times do I have to turn the other cheek? How many shirts off my back do I have to give? How many extra miles do I have to go to carry this person's stuff? Do you see that in the context of these verses, what Jesus is getting at is don't turn away the person who wants to borrow. Yes, it may be about money, but where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Generosity is a lifestyle. It involves my shirt. It involves my extra mile. It involves my money. It involves my time. It involves my energy. It involves turning the other cheek. It involves refusing to pull a sword out. It refuses. It involves refusing to take my tongue out and be mean. It involves not being retaliatory. It means being kind and generous to people. It is a life that is more than reasonable in response. It is irresistible. It's unflappable. It's unstoppable. But most of all, it's generous. You get to the story of Jesus as he's walking toward the Mount Gogota where he's going to be crucified. And he has no more energy left to spend. And a Roman soldier finds a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene. And he says, you carry the cross. I'm so glad that Simon didn't stop and say, I'll just go an extra mile. But he willingly did what was asked of him. Jesus might not have had the strength to take it, to get to the place of execution. You know what? I'm even more happier that Jesus went the extra mile when that took him all the way from the heights of heaven to the depths of hell. Along the way, they let him slander his name. Along the way, he was allowed to be slapped. Along the way, They did take his coat off of his back. They gambled it. They left him on the cross naked, beaten, abused. He never tried to hold on to his stuff. See, we come to a cross to pay a debt that we cannot pay. But our Savior never holds back. He gives freely. And he gives again and again and again. And it's not like we just run to him oh, once a year when we screw up. If we're honest, for most of us, it's probably a daily, hourly thing. And he never stops forgiving us. He never repays evil with evil. Instead, he repays it with grace and mercy. This is the Savior that we serve. This is the God we worship. This is the one who took his, took our place. He lived the life that we should have lived. He died the death that we should have died. So this morning, we don't sit here, enemies. We don't sit here under bondage or under sin. But we have been forgiven. And this is the life that he's calling to us as his followers. See, most of us are good with the letter of the law. But Jesus is saying, go beyond that. Be irresistible in your faith. Be willing to go the extra mile. See, I don't know about you, but every time I meditate on the cross, every time I come to the communion table and reflect on what Jesus has done for me, and see that his love has been poured out so lavishly for me. It makes me want to say, God, I want to be more like you, because an eye for an eye will leave the entire world blind. But I want to be like you where, because you have given me grace when I don't deserve it, help me to extend grace to those who have offended me. When you have given me love, When I was unlovable, help me to extend love to those who have no right to my love. When you took me in, when I was an orphan, unwanted, help me to show compassion and mercy and grace. What is Jesus calling us to in this text? He's calling us to model him. He's calling us to be like him. Because what he's communicating is, 
this is what I've done for you. This is what I've given my life to you for. Now you go and do likewise. So this morning as we come to the table, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. I'm sure even now, there are people in your mind that you are thinking, I absolutely hate this person. And in the middle of this sermon, the Holy Spirit is reminding you of that person. Would you let the Holy Spirit minister forgiveness and healing in your life that you can model Jesus? And they might not deserve it, but you can model Jesus because you don't deserve it. And so as you come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your life. As a community of faith, these are hard things for us to do on our own. That's why Jesus says, I never leave you to do it on your own. But when I died and was buried and resurrected, I now live inside of you. I'm helping you. I'm empowering you. I'm transforming you. And so, will you let the Holy Spirit transform you this morning as we come to the table? Let's pray. Father, as we come to the table this morning, we're reminded of a Savior who was slapped repeatedly for our sins. One who lost his coat. One who went the extra mile, beaten with a cross on his back. Who took our place So as we come this morning, we come with gratitude and say, thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. Now, Father, I just ask that your Holy Spirit will enable us to reflect Jesus in this world. Help us to model this lifestyle to the world that we live in. Help our faith to be irresistible because we want others to see you. We don't want to just be people that claim or profess to be Christians. We want Christ to be so evident in our lives that people will look at us and they will know immediately that we belong to you. So God, help us. As we come to you, we cry out and say, God, without you, we cannot do this. It is impossible. So help us. We love you. This morning, I'm going to...